It is my the, pip, the title of my paper is called "In Harmony or Out of Tune: Effective and Emotional Drug Feeds of Online Fires." Effective moments are crucial to understanding social bonding and conflict, and are intrinsically related to collective singing. For example, think of the highly charged atmosphere of many bodies singing at a football match or during a political protest. This paper critically investigates the effective space of the all-male choir to see what being in harmony or out of tune means for men who embody these spaces. The growing popularity of choir singing reflects a desire to use collective voices in harmonic expression, yet transforming the way in which we use our voices has a much greater impact on social relations than the social health benefits suggest. I'm going to use a case study of all-male choirs in London, and this paper is going to situate the power of voice within a wider socio-political context and also within gender theory. The voice can be coaxed, trained, manipulated, allowed or even encouraged to be natural and authentic, raised or softened to be in harmony with others, or remain out of tune and unable to fit in. So this paper is going to challenge the idea of harmony that is inherent in group singing and explore the dangers of such solidarity for those who are out of tune and are able to harmonise with others. So before I begin, I just want to uh, ask a question and also give you a little bit of an introduction of who I am. Is anyone here is in a choir? Does anyone sing in a choir? Okay, a couple of, a couple of people. Okay. Um, the other thing I should say is I am uh, I'm in the Department of Sociology and I know very little about, about music at all. I've never, I'm not a musician, I've never had any background in music. I don't really know anything from a scholarly fashion about music at all. So the reason this is very interesting for me is because I'm very interested in the sociology of gender and also thinking about um, what gendered spaces promote different bonding and conflicts and the inclusion and the exclusion. But I have never studied anything to do with music. So this, coming to this is actually very new for me um, and really quite exciting because I'm using uh, a very kind of new way of thinking about um, gendered spaces and power relations in those spaces. So um, I wanted to just make that very clear, or it might become, become clear for those who are, uh, know a lot about music as I, as I go on. But I'd like to know more about it, but I'd also like to know more about it in these specific contexts. Um, what I also thought was interesting about the second panel was the um, discussion they had at the end about this idea of atmosphere and, or lack of it, and ambience and affects, because I'm actually quite interested in that. Um, and I'd like to see how that those things can also fit into this space of a choir. So choirs have become quite a national fascination, exemplified by the substantial rise of the non-institutional and secular community choirs, the BBC series, The Choir with Gareth Malone, some of you may know of that. And choir singing has a long history of shared belonging from collective spiritual worship through to political activism. And studies into group singing claim to have significant physical, psychological, and emotional health benefits in those who engage in it. So grassroots and secular community choirs differ from institutional choirs following the natural voice ethos that anybody can sing, and that singing is good for you. New community choirs are formed all over the UK, and the growing popularity of choir singing reflects a desire to use collective voices in harmony and expression Yet transforming the ways we use our voices has a much greater impact on social relations and the and ideas of belonging that I think these um, health benefits suggest. This idea that it's a blanket, singing is good for you, singing uh, does good things to the body, singing does good things to get your impact. So to open my paper on this case study of all male choirs, I want to first relate my experience into this scholarly uh, study of choir so far and provide a bit of background um, on this, how this all came about. Um, so on the 30th of January 2015, um, I held a special one-day symposium as part of my growing interest into the effective emotional and political geographies of singing and sound, which actually Natalie, who's in the audience, attended a couple of years ago. We couldn't believe it was two years that it's run by. Um, so fascinated by this kind of central geography of sound and what this can mean for social politics of gender, I began to consider more widely the role of music and singing for alternative forms of worship, political activism, social justice, community cohesion, feelings of identity, belonging, and so on. And so this idea of singing from the same hymn sheet 
um, was born from an amalgamation of ideas, but what was interesting is that it grew at a surprisingly quite rapid rate, reflecting a very timely and hugely <coughs> interdisciplinary interest in the social politics of singing, much like today, you know, with these, uh, lots and lots of interdisciplinary uh, interest in this one subject. Um, I tentatively also put out a call on the Critical, critical Geography Forum for those who may be interested in choirs and collective song. I was completely overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of responses and emails from researchers across the disciplines of music and geography, sociology, psychology, divinity, those working with youth groups, musical directors, practitioners working in the fields of community cohesion, and also those interested in emotional well-being. And these range from the role of choirs in political activism, the rise of choir in the times of austerity, um, very much based on something based on um, atmospheres, uh, this idea of effective embodiment and atmospheres of collecting singing, um, and a lot of it to do with worship. And it was clear that choir seemed to be a topic that was tapping into social issues that were far more wide-ranging than I first expected. And each panel brought home what I initially had suspected, that the effective role of collective singing can actually tell us something else. Um, not just something else about how we express our voices, but something else about the wider issues of social justice, inclusion, conflict, solidarity, and about past and present political climates, austerity, citizenship, and nationhood. Um, so, at the same time, I was talking to a choir director in London about the growing popularity of his all-male choirs in London, which had defied the more established trend that community and grassroots are uh, predominantly uh, made up of women. There's been a lot written about gender and singing in schools, um, which focuses mainly on young boyhood melancholia and the, vo the vocal projection of masculinity. And it's widely agreed that it, it is in youth where boys have put off from singing and not wanting to, in inverted commas, sound like girls. This is uh, the work of Ashley Tversman In the campaign to get men singing, some argue a case for recuperative masculinity through singing, um, remasculizing singing, men and emotions to make this activity much more manly. But others, such as Ashley and McBride, um, who wrote a paper called Singing Sissies and Sexual Identity, also were quite critical of this real men sing to try and sell singing as a masculine activity. So I was speaking to the choir director who runs this all male choir called the Chaps Choir, I don't know if anyone's heard of it, in, um, in, um, in London. And uh, he was saying that um, he had run mixed community choirs for years and years. And it used to be a handful of men and mostly women. And a handful of men made up the bases, um, but mostly it was women who were um, coming to these um, community choirs. Um, but when he put out a call to try and think about whether or not we could have a space that was all male choirs, suddenly he had 60 men wanting to come to the first rehearsal and another 60 on the waiting list. And he thought that was very, he couldn't quite work out what was going on there because he'd been struggling to try and get them in the, through the door for years and years. And suddenly here they all were in their jobs but not wanting to join mixed community choirs. So I was quite interested, well we were both quite interested, in about the space of the all male choir and what was it that was so appealing and more so what it is, it is about the use of a voice in harmony that leads to this experience of group singing being so enriching to the men who have participated. So I'm thinking um, about harmony and also this idea of a shared purpose in choirs. And the research I found on choirs, collective singing and the pursuit of harmony is very much embedded in the psychology of music and the social and organisational factors, characteristics and relationships that co-create a collective experience. So within this, a clear group identity is central to being in harmony, and this supports across the suggestion the process of collective music making generated an affiliative sense of a shared purpose and meaning. So I was wondering if there does group singing have to have some sort of shared purpose? It's easy to identify many of the shared interests in choirs, whether this be for spiritual worship or political activism, and many groups invite members to explicitly join in singing towards a common goal. The most obvious example is singing to or for or about God. The origins of church, gospel and spiritual choirs are very well established deep and enduring. Yet many secular choirs also invited kindred spirits, as it were, shared identities or those passionate about a common cause. So think of it, take examples for exa uh, like, um, uh, Alice was doing, a, I was really 
disappointed to see that Alice was going to do something on the military wives choir, but, but hasn't in the end. That kind of thing was quite interesting. It's a kind of a shared, some sort of shared identity, although there'll be, a, I'm assuming there'll be quite a lot of differences in there as well. Or the London Gay Men's Chorus, or Protest in Harmony, or Raised Voices Choir, um, who sing about justice in the environment. Um, and there's the feminist chorus, and the list goes on and on, and it's quite disparate as well as long. But when it came to um, uh, the Chaps Choir in London, they, apart from gender, there didn't seem to be any other commonality. And when it comes to men singing, there still appears to be a shared commonality other than gender. So, of course, football chants and the acoustic soundscapes of fan culture has been well established in both geography and sociology. And although that's not exclusively male focuses, it's certainly focused on masculinity and social class. So with regard to effective belonging, the atmosphere, again, of a football stadium and the collective sound made by thousands of bodies and voices in unison was actually how I first came to understand the drug effect, which actually is very prominent here at Durham, and, make, and making sense of that. But chanting in unison is quite different to the pursuit of harmony found in choirs, and I'm going to return to this effective difference later on. There has indeed, of course, been a tradition of male choral singing. This is nothing new in itself. From Georgian chants and nautical sea shanties, and perhaps, perhaps the most well-known here was the, the Welsh men's choir, which most of you will have heard of. But these still appear to be rooted in a tangible sense of connection. For example, studies into the Icelandic male choirs reveal that amongst the camaraderie and self-therapy, Icelandic men often sing for country and a sense of national identity. The roots of Icelandic male choir is clearly seen as a collaboration in the construction of a cultural identity of nationhood, a colonial vocal protest against Danish rule, and is very much connected with the landscapes and geography of the country, as singing out loud in nature is also a way to physically engage with the landscapes. So what is it about, um, ab about a group of 50 or um, 70 men together in North London, notoriously heralded as a space of significant diversity, fragmentation, and transient global populations. So to look at the Chaps Choir and their braces and catch you may be forgiven for assuming they are a fairly homogenous group. Yet Chaps Choir has an age range spanning seven decades, from 20 years of age to over 80, and occupations ranging from students <coughs> and bank managers, artists, film directors, um, creatives and conservatives, lawyers, recruitment consultants, fathers, grandfathers, Spanish drummers, Scottish pensioners, and queer speech therapists. It's predominantly white, with non-white men certainly present, but making up less than 25%. There's a greater diversity with regard to nationality, and also those who identify as straight, gay, bisexual, and queer. At present, there's no members who identify as trans, and three who uh, identified as having a disability. This relative diversity of men highlight that there's nobody's kind of tribe in the traditional sense, and the common denominator here actually is that there isn't one. And the cultural identity of the urban dweller is very impossible to pinpoint. Yet these um, London-based men appear to make connections with each other throughout the life course, perhaps wishing to come together as people struggling to remain connected in an increasingly alienated and at times quite harsh city. So at one uh, retired, um, member of the choir reflects, the choir affords a space for an embodied connection every week. And he says, to get here, I travel across London during the rush hour. My body is in really active mode, adrenaline fueled and quite stressed, digging through hordes of people, avoiding heavy traffic. The warm-up exercises help, me ground, help ground me and focus my attention on breathing, healing, the tensions in my body. They also help me interact with other members of the group which is in complete contrast to my journey. On the tube, there are people around you, but we never acknowledge each other apart from getting out of the way. With the choir, it's very different. You become sensitive to what's going on inside you, but that dynamic is shared with others. And so here we see the weekly choir as a space which facilitates <clears throat> connected rhythm to working or mundane weeks, where connections between bodies are played out in very different ways to other city spaces and commutes. However, this can be argued of most leisure, uh, singing and dance of both genders, and for the purposes of this paper, I want to focus on what it is about using your voice in harmony, which is particularly appealing to the effective experience and connection of this group of men. Sorry, please have a read that 
So, um, the methods I did for this were um, some focus groups with 22 participants. I did an interview with the director. Um, we did a creative writing piece with 18 participants where they had to immediately after the rehearsal write down how they were getting on and what they were feeling. Um, ongoing observations um, and the other thing to mention is that the focus scripts was also with very willing participants who'd been in the choir for a while and who were very desperate to speak to you and they, they were really up for that. Um, those who came to the choir, didn't like it and left, I've not got to speak to and they would be a very, very interesting group of people to speak to why they weren't no longer in the choir, why they didn't feel as though they connected at all. So these are overwhelmingly positive experiences. Um, and of course I haven't spoken to anyone who has an experience because they haven't been able to get in touch with them. Um, so that's a huge gap really in uh, thinking about those who um, did not feel as though they, they weren't um, part of this. So at the essence um, of the kind of data that it emerged, for many chaps the choir is a space where they can express themselves without the tyranny of competition which so often accompanies spaces of masculinity. Um, and here's a couple of quotes, they're quite dense, so I'll just read them out. And he, these are the kind of quotes that I was getting out about this theme of competition. And one of them says, I think we leave a lot of macho bullshit at the door when we come to the choir, because men are choosing to sing, and they're not choosing to sing like in the front man of a band. I mean, I've been a front man in a band, and it's kind of a lot more <laughs> ego-based. In a choir, it's a different feeling, it's softer, so I think naturally, you've already said you're going to sing in front of a whole lot of guys together, and already a lot of the aggression have gone. It's a very accepting and supportive base. I mean, you asked a question earlier about how does this compare to other groups. Well, I'm part of a cricket club, and I'm all for the cricket, but you know, they're a very accepting club, they're happy for anyone of any standard to come along and play. But when you're out on the pitch, you want to win. So if you drop or catch or something, yes, a few people are like, yeah, don't worry about it. But you can tell there's, we've dropped it again. I've never had that experience here at the choir. I don't feel as though anyone has ever made me feel like I've let them down. At the same time, I strive to do my best. So I don't feel as though there's any sense of competition. And the last quote is, yes, it's important because I find singing with other people um, embarrassing. It's kind of emotional. I don't know. I can't quite put my finger on it, what it is. But it's the sort of thing you're doing on your own would be super scary. But with a bunch of other people, you're all doing something together where you're all simultaneously risk looking ridiculous. So I think for me, it's what breaks down the barriers. Once you've sung with someone, it seems to demolish any sense of hierarchy because afterwards in the pub, you feel fine just talking to each other. You can approach them, ask how their week was. This might be someone much older, younger than you, earning 10 times as much as you. You know, it doesn't even pop into your radar because you've been singing together for a couple of hours. And so, thinking about the importance of repertoire blending and listening, this really kind of came out as something which I want to focus on and what I would like to focus on actually when I write something like this. Because I've been looking to, to think about how the voice can be um, a site of gender disruption, interruption and confirmation through this act of singing and trying to do some research into this. And of course there's the, this very kind of... Um, um, body of literature that looks at the perceptions of what, of what is a feminine voice in terms of high, soft, attractive, seductive, um, subordinate, um, and also, and that also is very much disrupted in music. So for example, women's presence in genres of rap or rock or pump or the riot curl movements. But also this idea of masculine voices, low, loud, dominant, dark, or monotonous, or less viable in pitch and expressive intonation. And I was quite interested in how these ideas of gender could be disrupted through using this voice differently. And returning to the Icelandic male choirs, um, Falconer, who looks at um, this uh, study, found that the men in the male voice choir preferred singing beautiful and gentle lullabans. And these kind of songs gave them their biggest kicks, um, and singing um, uh, made them more of a man. And they argued, you might have expected these guys to get the greatest pleasure from singing rousing soldiers choruses or something like that. But what I found is what men love singing the most is the exact opposite of that. So moving beyond, I'm going to, to wrap up now, but moving beyond the safe space of collaboration and friendship, I then took a closer look at what the chaps were saying about the role of song and repertoire in their feelings towards the choir. And central to this narrative, um, and I'm not going to have time to read them out, but <clears throat> central to this narrative 
was this um, idea of blending and listening and taking a step back. So to blend into the background as opposed to make yourself her voice heard the loudest was reflected on at being incongruent to the expectations of uh, characteristics of getting ahead, of being in front of winning. And there was a lot of this idea about exposing yourself, blending um, uh, is really important. Um, the fact that if you, you uh, make yourself heard more than anyone else, then that's, that's actually going to disrupt the choir and that's not really part of what it's all about. And that really kind of came um, across. So for the chaps, it appears that engaging in an activity that is approached with humble humility is to discover what is listening. And the men in the study expressed a tiredness of raised voices, and group singing enables expression to be facilitated in a different way. Yet this is not a men's group, and the success is very implicit in its nature. So not one of these voices has to stand out stronger, and more importantly, um, uh, more vulnerable than anyone else's. And just to conclude, I think understanding the power of voice has a huge pot potential for subverting <coughs> gender, especially through a comparative analysis of all male or perhaps all female in mixed groups. <laughs> However, it's equally important to consider the dangers of effective unity, because I think the idea of those who promote quiet singing as the, the is sort of magical um, uh, solution to anyone who's having a terrible time, and shared belonging in choirs, and certain bodies and identities may be out of tune and serve as a threat to the celebration of harmony. Choral singing is not an automatic panacea to silencing. The rise of the corporate choir and the exclusive nature of the natural voice practitioners network can indeed work to reproduce social and gendered inequalities and take away the power of certain voices, silencing and hiding societal experiences. So while this data very much is largely celebratory, I think it's also important to consider that powerful effects may work to silence some people rather than give them voice, and this may be a significant risk in carrying this work on the Thanks so much. That was a wonderful paper. It was really rich. And I was just, just at the very end, the last 30 seconds or so, you got into stuff which I wanted to ask about. So I yeah. wonder if you could say a bit more about the harmony, this kind of key word, because it, it, sometimes it's a little bit unclear whether you're using it in a musical sense or in a metaphorical sense. And I was wondering what you see as being the relationship between a musical, you know, musical harmony, yes. a sonic harmony, and social harmony. Yes. And whether, in fact, I mean, what you seem to be suggesting at the end was that actually we talk about the tyranny, tyranny of competition mm. but there may also be a kind of tyranny of harmony as well. Yes. Does that, yes. Is that being true? Absolutely. I mean, I, as I said, I don't know anything about music. I'm no. I, I, um, not in, in, uh, in any way trained about it, so I don't really know about harmonies or, or anything like this. But uh, so I think I'm only going on the data, I'm only going on the narrative data of which people spoke about. I think um, those who could understand it in a, in a more nuanced way would be able to do that. Um, but this idea of, um, I couldn't help but look, but want to focus on this idea of harmony and voice because so much of the day, because they didn't just speak about this where we go every week and then we go to the pub and this is what we talk about. There was a lot of that. But there seemed to be an enormous amount into, uh, into the fact that they had to blend with other people. Um, so I think that's what I mean. I suppose this idea of being in harmony is that it is both uh, in harmony in terms of the music um, and also in, uh, that would lead to then a, a harmony in the group. Um, but very much this idea that uh, blending meant that they had to um, soften and listen. And, th and that was actually something that was very appealing to them because it was very um, different to other spaces where they were expected to excel and stand out, and um, especially those who worked in particular sectors, where it was all about very much, you know, you need to make yourself better than everyone else, and you need to make sure you're noticed, and you need to get your voice heard, and you need to do something that's very different. And this was about blending in. So I suppose the harmony in that way, and I, I wanted to also, the reason I like to also juxtapose it with some of the kind of um, football chanting, where it's a kind of one loud, powerful voice, um, and it's kind of like a roar, um, and the power is in that that one um, um, sound, I suppose, um, all kind of, big, um, whereas this is having different harmonies for those basses and tenors and things like that, and we have to blend to make, to create a sound. Does that make sense? So I wanted to kind of, kind of pinpoint on what it, if that's relevant at all,
to, the, to actually what else is going on in terms of why they wanted to do this for, for different reasons. 